Hello and welcome back to The Hatch. I'm Rosie Murphy. And I'm Sammy Roth, and this is the podcast where we talk about Lost. We're in season six, and we have reached episode 14, The Candidate, really getting into the end game now. Yeah, I can't believe we're, we're this far and have this little left. Um, we're oh. going to talk about The Candidate, and we are going to have part two of our conversation with executive producer Gene Higgins, who we uh, heard from last week. Let's get right into it. We start every episode of The Hatch with our hot takes about the episode. Sammy, what is your hot take about The Candidate? Well, so this being one of the most intense and highly dramatic and important episodes of Lost, I'm going to, of course, start with like the the least substantial, least important hot take imaginable, which is that uh, when the monster is like approaching and they're all in the cages and the lights go out, I thought it was very funny and kind of interesting. Hurley gets a better one-liner than Frank Lapidus. Mm. Frank Lapidus just says, "Uh uh-oh, which is like, you know, to remind us that Frank is there, I guess, but Hurley gets the line, and we're dead, which is, you know, not the best one-liner now that I've said it out loud, but better than Lapidus gets. I don't know. I don't know what they were doing in that scene. Lapidus should have had a great one-liner there. Well, right. And like, narratively, Lapidus's role at this point is to fly the plane at the end and also to make the one-liners. Exactly. He and if not that... Exactly. That's yeah. that's my that's my gripe. Where was the good Lapidus one liner there? What do you got, hot take wise? So about the same scene actually when we're in the, the Dharma camp and it really felt to me like the, the writers were maybe just hitting us over the head with the idea of what might have been between Sawyer and Kate. Right? We're back at this yeah. place where they were trapped together, they had sex, they had like it was like maybe the peak of like the Sawyer Kate romance such as it was and like i can't there wasn't one specific line it was just the whole scene the way it's shot the way they talk to each other the way the one man threatens kate's life and said or excuse me widmore threatens kate's life and says you know her name's not on this list and sawyer gives in and it's it's the same thing that we've done a thousand times when kate says uh oh, he wouldn't have shot me and sawyer says too bad i'm saving you anyway like you know what might have been yeah I um I actually I, I enjoyed it. I know it was hitting I did over too. the head, but yeah, okay, there we go. Yeah, no. To be that clear, actually, this is a positive take. <laughs> that actually reminds me one more one more hot take for me. Another very tiny gripe about an otherwise incredible episode, which is that the I think I've maybe even shared this complaint before, but it's so relevant here. The whole thing about Kate not being on the list, mm. and that that's Widmore's excuse for you know why or so, Sawyer explains to Kate why Widmore could have killed her because she you know her name was crossed out in the cage. We're gonna get the. Uh, week after next or the episode after next, the incredibly unsatisfying explanation from Jacob that he crossed out her name when she became a mother, but it's just fine. She can have the job if she wants. It's like, my best guess about this is that they needed a way to condense the number of people they wanted to be candidates into six, you know, six spots because there were six numbers when they decided this is how they were going to explain the numbers. Mm -hmm. And so they said, who can we get rid of? And the person who they had the this was the best they could come up with, which is, okay, we're going to cross Kate off and that's Jacob's reason for it. And we're going to combine Jin and Son into one of just Quan because we don't, you know, and we'll make that mysterious, ooh, which mm-hmm. one is it? But that helps us get down to six. And, you know, it's like Son became a mother too. So in theory, right. she didn't, you know, it, it, it's not, this goes back to my larger point about how whenever they try really hard to provide specific, yes. explicit answers to questions, it ends up frequently being more annoying than satisfying. Um but it, that that rears its head in this episode. I agree. Moments of the, the clutter that was bothering me last week, definitely in this episode. And I will say, if I may share another hot take. Sure, go um, for it. <laughs> obviously, the end of this episode is remarkably sad. I cried while watching this. I texted you to tell you I was crying. And, Can't and confirm. you said, you know, I will be doing the same later. And, you know, uh, Sun and Jin's death that we're going to talk about at length. Saeed, once again, really just gets the short end of the stick in this. And I think what he does oh. is heroic and incredible. Okay. Um, and is a testament to this idea that he is still in there and the darkness doesn't have him or whatever. But nobody mourns Saeed. And there's oh, not a mo- There's no big Jaquino score. There's no catharsis he just grabs the bomb and he runs and there's that moment where 
Sawyer and Jack are like yelling at each other about what to do. And somebody says, what about Saeed? And Jack says, there is no Saeed. And then they leave. And that's like all we get as far as a moment to mourn this character. And that just made me sad. You know, I, I felt that who Saeed was and who he became in the story, I wish he had gotten more of a a moment of his own. So I, I hadn't thought about it that way. And I'm, I, I can't argue with you. I, I can't disagree. You're right. There is not any time given to, mourn, given to mourning Saeed. I, I still thought this was a pretty incredible and epic send off for him. But oh, I, sure. I, but let, let's let's get back to that because we're going to have to spend you know the bulk of yes. this I think just discussing that ten minutes and you know near the end of the episode before we before we get into it more deeply we have a, we have a couple of listener hot takes right yeah let's start with Ian hi Sammy and Rosie this is Ian for calling in from North Reading Massachusetts um, with a hot take for the candidate but before I get to that I just want to say thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for the amazing contribution you guys have made to the lost community as your show nears its end. With that said, I know it's a divisive issue, but I fall squarely on the side of Jen was absolutely right to stay with Sun and the submarine. Um, thematically, they have been divided throughout their lives. They've been divided in time. They've been divided in space. They've been divided by language and lies. But finally, in death, they come together and finally make that connection that had always eluded them. And I also just think it's really in character with Jen. I just can't imagine him leaving his wife there to die alone. You know, I think he absolutely made the right decision. That's my hot take. Thanks a lot. Bye. So, uh, Ian, thank you very much for the hot take. We love making this podcast. We're glad uh, you appreciate it, too. Um, the Sun Jin scene, again, we're going to get more more into that deeper in this discussion. But are, are there people out there who are criticizing Jin yeah. for staying on the sub? I, that that's actually news to me. I didn't. I mean, I I can see the you know the argument for it. Oh, he should go and be with their daughter. But I I didn't I didn't realize that was a thing of like people being upset with Jin. Yeah, I thought this was something that we all agreed on <laughs> in terms of you know obviously it's it's tragic. It's like the height of tragedy. But of this being the way their story ought to have ended, if it couldn't have had a happy ending. I I thought so too. Yeah. I guess I guess neither I mean, I of certainly us was, think that. was online enough when this was happening. Um, I was online, but maybe not online enough. Yeah. Um, but no, we 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 agree, and we'll we'll talk more about that. Uh, one more listener hot take here from Audrey. Hi, Sammy and Rosy. It's Audrey for the hot take. First of all, I remember vividly crying so hard at the end of this episode. I think I cried more than in the finale. I could not believe that three central characters were gone just like that. Um, to be honest, I don't know why they had to kill Jin and Sun like that. Their deaths were felt so brutal to me, especially after all they had to endure the past season. Um, of course, justice for Saeed. <laughs> I find it really ironic that he died because of a bomb. Remember, Sawyer accused him of planting one in the plane in like season one, episode two. Just a devastating episode. I mean, yeah, I don't have a lot to add to this. It it was brutal. Um after everything they've been through for Sun and Jin to to die this way. And after just being reunited at the end of last week's episode in a way that is so, you know, and, and this was one of my big complaints with the last episode, in a way that is almost treated as like an afterthought by the story. Oh, yeah, it's it's brutal. I mean, that's all there is to it. It is. I I do think that, I hate to be that person being like, oh, a TV show needs to kill people to, you know, raise the stakes and make you mm-hmm. feel like, you know, like this matters and there's, there's you know, real potential for anyone to go here. But I, Lost was going to kill some people in the final season, right? I mean, like, you've, oh, got of the, course. you've got the big bad, he's the man in black, he's been the, you know, the villain behind it all, like, well, yeah, him and Jacob, you could argue too. But, but I... I don't see how they could have made this made this season and made it you know really resonate and and feel real if if they hadn't killed off a couple of beloved characters. Like I'm not saying it had to be Jin and Son. I I can see the arguments for and against that, but but there was going to be an episode of season six of Lost that was going to make you cry from losing somebody to the Man in Black schemes, and this is how it was. I agree a hundred percent. And more more people are still going to <laughs> to die here before we're done. Yeah. Um, well, just Jack, I guess. Um, yeah, just Jack. <laughs> but 
And Charles it, Widmore. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. <laughs> but, any, I mean, this is... I think this is my going to be my feeling overall as we come out of season six is that I wish they had just sort of distributed the events a little bit differently and kind of spread out some of the emotional stuff. So maybe, you know, two weeks ago, Sun and Jin could have reunited. And then last week they die. And then this week Saeed dies. And, you know, just... Maybe we should hold off on this, but I I want to I can't help myself now. I thought mm-hmm. the Saeed moment, yeah, I thought that was incredibly well done, and there are a few reasons for that. I, I just think this is such a redeeming moment mm-hmm. for Saeed, and we see him at his most heroic and his most really at his most brilliant here. He has to he has to think so fucking quickly. I mean, there's like a he's got like ten. I counted. There's yeah. ten seconds between when the watch starts to, you know, hurry its countdown and you realize it backfires, 10 seconds between that, less than 10 seconds between that, and when Saeed starts giving Jack instructions. Listen carefully. There's a well on the main island, half a mile south from the camp we just left. Desmond's inside it. Locke wants him dead, which means you're going to need him. Do you understand me? And why are you telling me this? Because it's going to be you, Jack. Saeed has to talk so quickly and it's like he knows what he's got to do he knows he's got to sacrifice himself he feels like that's his responsibility that occurs to him immediately but he's also smart enough and you know in the in the zone enough to realize like i can't just run out of here with this bomb like i've got to tell jack about desmond first Mm -hmm. and i've got to do that as succinctly as possible while driving home the message of how important this is and on top of that that decision to sacrifice himself that instructions to jack he also has the presence of mind and like the pathos about him when Jack says, why are you telling me this? To respond with the message, because it's going to be you, Jack. Mm-hmm. The fact that all of those things are in Saeed's head and that he's able to process them that quickly and decide to sacrifice his life and give Jack this this incredible message of like, here's what's in your future and I can see it and I know you can too. And just in those moments before his death, I mean, I, I, I just, I, I couldn't have scripted, I don't think anyone could have scripted better than the, the writers in this episode, a better ending for Saeed than, than those, you know, 20 seconds. It's so true to who he is, right? And, you know, the ability to detach himself from his emotions and act like a soldier, right? That's the first thing we learn about Saeed. And, yeah, to to think and give directions and take directions and move. And, no, I agree. I think it's a really, really good if Saeed had to go I think this is a a really true way to do it um totally and you're right like a soldier but like a soldier I mean fighting for his friends yeah like yeah that that couldn't be more redeeming which just makes me feel more annoyed about (laughs) the first 70 percent of this season like (laughs) the message we were getting for not the first, I guess, the you know, the middle 10 episodes. The message we were getting week after week was, Saeed is lost to the darkness, blah, blah, blah. And only two episodes ago, do we, you know, when he decides not to kill Desmond, which we still, as the viewer, don't know at this point. Um, right, we learn that in this we moment here. We learn that right here, that he didn't kill Desmond. So all at once we're hit with, oh, crap. Saeed, this is really Saeed, and this has maybe been Saeed for a while. I think we'd been getting hints, you know, yeah. like with the Desmond scene and his scene with Locke after the Desmond scene, that there was maybe something more still going on here. Yeah. I think it had been building a little, they could have built it a little better. Yeah. And just, but, I think they closed the loop really well, finished the race really strong, but there were some, <laughs> some wobbles in there that aren't my favorite, which, yeah, no, this is, yeah. they they brought it home. They did. And, yeah. and, and I, I agree with you that it would have been nice to, would have been nice. It, they absolutely should have had a moment later on the beach where in addition to Jin and Sun, you know, they were mourning Saeed too. But in terms of how that sequence progresses, where it's just like sudden and then everything goes to absolute hell, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. there's obviously not time to mourn him in that moment. Like that right. sequence played out the way it needed to play out. And that added to the shock value of Saeed, I think. Anyway. Yeah. Let's back it up. Where are you on this episode? You told me you had a thesis about it. Oh, this isn't so much a thesis as just like 
I'm so sorry I've been such a downer the last couple of weeks. We don't have very many episodes left. <laughs> and I want to be so happy and so positive. But there have just been some things that have irked me. And the thing in this episode that really, really irked me is in the flash sideways where what we get is a Jack who refuses to the, accept the possibility that John is okay as he is. John is okay being in a wheelchair. And I think John, everything we see of John suggests that he is, that he is pretty happy, except for, you know, sort of the burden that he's carrying in terms of feeling responsible for his father's injury. But he and Helen seem very in love. He seems very content. You know, we see him making jokes about using the wheelchair and like, I wonder what it would look like if there were a Jack who could accept, maybe this doesn't need to be fixed. Like, people live with physical disabilities all the time and are completely, you know, able to live very full lives. And like, I just kind of wanted to shake Jack and say, like, this isn't a problem. Like, this is not, it's not broken. I don't know. And I, I don't know if that's just because sort of norms have changed over the last 15 years and like the way that we talk about disability has changed. But I don't know. I don't like that framing of like, John is, it felt like what Jack was feeling and maybe what the viewer was supposed to pick up is that like John is broken and refuses to accept this help when I felt like I was on John's side. And it was like, why is this guy being so pushy? So I, I agree with you a little bit, but once again, I think I actually have a very different take on this episode and how mm. I reacted to the story. Okay. Um, no, I mean, I for one, I think you're, you're you're absolutely right that if this were made again today, the framing and and discussion of disability issues would probably be quite different. Going back to yeah. season one with Lock and the Wheels, yeah, not just in this episode, so can't can't deny that. Also, agree that Jack was Jack was way out of bounds here. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, for one, he's violating doctor patient confidentiality. I mean, I, I all over the map, like. <laughs> you know, he's going to Bernard to get Locke's medical records and without Locke's permission and going and to And not see... even Locke's, like Anthony Cooper's medical records. Yeah, to get his... Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, yeah. Jack's, Jack's way overstepping. And But, but, but one, I think that's the point of this storyline, mm-hmm. that Jack is... The whole thing with the afterlife and with the flash sideways, right, is they're kind of having to relearn some of right. the lessons that they learned in life to kind of remind them, I think, of, you know, here's who you were before... And here's how you grew into the person that you became. And here's and that's the person you're, you know, just reminding yourself to be, to be ready to move forward. So to me, this is very clearly Jack relearning that most important lesson, which is to learn to let go. Mm. I mean, Helen, Helen says as much to him when, when they're at the, you know, the nursing home. She says, please, Dr. Shepard, just leave this alone. You saved John's life. Why can't that be enough? Because it's not. And then he has what I think is a really beautiful conversation with Locke at the end of the episode after yeah. all the craziness has gone down, where Jack says to Locke about, you know, the guilty feels about what happened to his father that was his fault. Jack says to him, What happened happened. And you can let it go. What makes you think letting go is so easy? It's not. In fact, I don't really know how to do it myself. And that's why I was hoping that maybe you could go first. And I think that's beautiful. Yeah. And so to me, the yes, you know, you want to shake Jack a little because he's being unfair to Locke, but I think that's very much the point of this story, that, that Jack is you know, sort of just going through another round of, of this lesson. And, and and that's going to go all the way to the finale. That's the thing his yeah. father says to him in the church, to remember and to let go. He says that's why they're there. That's why all of them are there. So with Locke, I, I actually disagree about the show sort of making us think that he's, you know, happy and everything's fine. Mm-hmm. Like, he's presenting that, certainly. But, you, you know, go back earlier in the season to The Substitute and... You know, he he lied to Helen about going on the walkabout and he came back and he expressed that and once he found out that immense frustration, like, I thought I could do this, but I couldn't. Of course I couldn't. And I'm never going to be able to walk you down the aisle. And are you really okay with that? Like, mm-hmm. And what I think we learned this episode is that 
yes, while he presents as, you know, oh, I'm fine, I can do this, you know, this is just who I am, that in a way it seems like he's punishing himself, Mm. I think, because he feels guilt over what he did to his father, what he, you know, he feels it was his fault that his father has, you know, become basically comatose, but alive. Um, And I think that he feels like, I think this is strongly suggested here that he feels like this is his punishment and he deserves it, that he lost the use of his legs and that that's why he's rejecting Jack's overtures here. Um, so maybe if, if you read it differently, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's your call. But I, I actually interpreted this as a very beautiful storyline that was meaningful from both of their sides. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I don't disagree with anything that you've said. I don't know what it is about this version of Jack that is just, you know, rubbing me in such a wrong way. Maybe it's because now for the better part of a year we have been watching a new Jack and we've forgotten about how over the top the old Jack was and maybe seeing that pushy, aggressive, insistent, I've got all the answers, Jack, is almost more almost worse by contrast, you know, Um, because the Jack we're seeing on the island is so different. I don't know why it struck me so strongly because in season, you know, in seasons one and two, it was like, okay, Jack's doing his thing again. Um, That's just who Jack is. But this, I was like, whoa, I don't, and I don't know, is this like more, do you think this was more intense than, than early episodes of, of Jack flashbacks or, or stuff he does on island? And it was like played up to demonstrate that. I actually had a bunch of notes about how I still feel the mellow Jack coming through here. Interesting. I mean, I was thinking about moments where, um, like moments where he goes to Bernard to ask for the medical, and not that his actions aren't still, you know, pushy and overly aggressive, but like when, when Bernard, and I love the appearance of Bernard, by the yeah, way, of we course, of shout course. out uh, how wonderful he is. But when, when Bernard asks him, do you mind if I ask why you're so interested in Mr. Locke? Jack, Matthew Fox, he gets this sort of sheepish look on his face and he kind of looks at the floor and kind of shuffles his feet a little bit like he's embarrassed and nervous to be saying this. And his answer is, he and I met about a week ago. We were on the same flight from Australia. So one, I, I felt like, you know, again, this is Matthew Fox showing a little bit more of that mellow side that Gene Higgins was talking about. And two, I think it speaks to the fact that Jack is really being motivated here by the fact that he senses that there's something more going on. I, I felt the same thing in the moment with um with Claire when he, you know, asks her to stay with them and he says, you know, he says we're family. Mm-hmm. I, I read that as as Jack, you know, knowing that there's something deeper here and that, you know when when Bernard says, I was on your flight too, he just has this Matthew Fox has this look on his face. Mm-hmm. I just get the sense that is and then at the end, the vulnerable moment that I mentioned with with Locke where he, he says, I was hoping maybe you could go first to show me how to let go I interpret this all as as Jack, he knows there's something going on here. He can't quite put his finger on what it is. You know, he can't help but pursue Locke because this is his instinct, is he's got to fix things. But I, I definitely think there's a little bit more of a, you know, spiritual, metaphysical aspect to it of a, you know, a, a sort of new version of, of Jack going about this in a different way. So I, so no, I, I, I don't know why, uh, why it rubbed you the way it did. I'm sorry, but I, I read it totally different. That's interesting because the, in that final scene um, between Jack and John, the, the one line, the final line that I wrote down in my column of notes about this is when Jack says, when you didn't want the surgery, I felt like I had to understand why. And I thought if I could figure out why you're in that chair, then maybe, and then John interrupts and and tells the story. And I don't know, when you didn't want the surgery, I felt I had to understand why. Like that to me is just classic, classic Jack of, I can't accept that there is mystery and that some people may simply want, you know, (laughs) want things that I do not think are right. And uh, then, of course, John goes on to tell the story and that scene ends with the what makes you think letting go is so easy conversation. But I think you're right that Jack is developing at like a pretty rapid pace here an self-awareness, like an understanding of, oh, I am really coming on strong here. I definitely agree with you that the those two sides of Jack are butting up against each other pretty close. The There can't be mystery here. I must mm-hmm. be able to resolve this versus... The, There's clearly um, so much mystery here. yeah. And I, Why were all these people on my plane? I think that both yeah. of those things are coming together to motivate him for sure. But yeah, I, I, I definitely found him to be less less grating and more um, 
more endearing in a way here while he's going about this having trouble letting go act than I did when he when he went through similar phases in earlier flashbacks and earlier in the show. Hmm. Let me keep thinking about this. Let me run this by you. Did you get mm-hmm. the sense that Bernard has already been awakened and knows what's going on? I was wondering about that. I don't know. Um, there's a way in which I feel like Rose and Bernard have been enlightened from the very beginning. Oh, yeah, you've talked about that Right, before. like as soon as they get to the island, they decide this is a miracle. Rose's cancer appears to be gone. We've been given a second chance. Let's just appreciate it and not get involved in any of this. And like, that's not what the island is about, of course. Um, but that is one way of, you know, if the island is about accepting and letting go, they were able to do that on like day 15, and I wonder if that, I wonder if the fact that they were able to do that so quickly on the island means that they just had a lot less far to go in the afterlife. That's an interesting theory. Like, for the hundredth time, I know the island is not purgatory, but <laughs> it, part of the concept of purgatory is like you spend as long there as you need in order to be cleansed of whatever you need to be cleansed of, right? And if if what we need to be cleansed of here is like our attachments like Rose and Bernard don't, they already seem pretty far along on that journey. So yeah, I think it's possible that Bernard in his own version of this sort of play has already been awakened. And well, it was just when, when Jack says to him, when, when Locke says, you know, he remembers who was in the accident with Locke when Bernard says who was in, he remembers. And Jack says, that was three years ago. You remember that? Mm-hmm. And and Bernard has this all-knowing smile and yeah. says, of course I do, Jack. That was the moment yeah. where I thought, wait, 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 Bernard might be in on it here. Right. And and Bernard immediately says, Oceanic 815, I sat across the aisle from you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, you might be right. But I think your I think your your purgatory observation is is relevant here that that it might have just been easier. For, and not only did they get there quickly or at least Rose did, Bernard took a little more time on the mm-hmm. island, but they also got to live out their lives on that island. So maybe they really built up a, you know, a healthy spirituality in a way that others didn't get a chance to. Yeah. If anyone listening to this has a hot take and wants to uh call in with their take on, on this or any other matters during our final few episodes here. The number is 9546-DHARMA, plus one, if you don't live in the United States. So I think we should probably talk a little bit more about Jin and Son. They only really get two one-on-one scenes in this episode, right? There's the one scene where um, they're talking quietly. I believe it's at the Dharma camp when Son gives Jin his wedding ring and Jin tells her that he's seen Woodmore showed him photos of Jian, and it's just very sweet and it's very nice. And then the other and very scene painful they get, to watch, knowing what's coming. <laughs> right, and then the other scene is is their their death. And gosh, you know one one thing that just occurred to me that's kind of tragic. They kind of flipped the uh, live together die alone equation on its head. The last few years of their life were live alone die together. Ooh. Oh God. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, once wow. I thought of it, I had to say it. <laughs> That's shocking. And so sad. Oh, my it God. <laughs> By the way, I was sure that Frank Lapidus was dead when I watched this the first time. I remember being startled when he oh, shows right. up floating in the water in the finale. I forgot um, about that. We don't see him get out. No. No, Frank's Frank's fate is left totally up in the air. But every, everything about it, I think, is perfect. I don't think I would change a moment of that sequence. In... in Oh, you you would, so go ahead. You're, you're no, no, I was just going to say it reminds me a lot of um, the incident sequence in yeah. that everything yeah. is going to hell very quickly, but also very slowly. And in in the case of the candidate, like Kate has, has a gunshot wound, Sawyer has a concussion, like lots and lots of people are gravely injured. And it becomes clear, I think, very quickly that like not everyone is going to make it out of here, but Boy, it could be anybody. So one one character we haven't talked about who I think deserves a serious discussion here, I actually think Sawyer is the most interesting and in some ways the most tragic character in this episode. Mm, because he ultimately causes the bomb to go off? Well, not only does he ultimately cause the bomb to go off, but Sawyer is trying so hard to save everyone here. Yeah. I mean, this is like the total inversion of the first Sawyer we met who was was, you know, selfish and only in it for himself and, you know, couldn't give a shit about anyone else. 
Sawyer is pretty much the leader here, right? I mean, Jack has Jack has abdicated leadership, and that's okay. He when you know he, he actually says to <laughs> says to Locke flat out here, they're not my people, and I'm not leaving the island. Mm-hmm. You know, so he's he's not leading these people. He's not trying to get them what they want anymore. Like he's doing his own thing. It is Sawyer who is you know who is wheeling and dealing here and coming up with plots and giving Jack instructions about how he's going to, you know, help them betray the man in black and help get them all off the island together. It's it's Sawyer who, you know, sets up the plan of attack of how they're in such a great, it's such a perfect manipulative way. It's Sawyer who's needed here to fight the man in black. Sawyer who makes the call of you guys stay back and then, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. Jack, you use that to go after him. Sawyer who has to make the tough call of Claire's not getting on the sub with us because if we wait for her, the man in black is getting on too, which is tough, but I think, you know, fair. And so it just, when it comes down to that moment of Saeed telling Sawyer, this is what we need to do to disarm the bomb, and Jack saying, no, 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 you have to trust me, we're going to be fine. It's just, it's so heart-wrenching to me to know that Jack is right, yeah, but to also understand and completely sympathize with Sawyer for not trusting Jack's judgment and for thinking, no, I, you know, I have to do what I have to do to save everyone here. Because when Jack is saying, don't touch it, we're going to be fine, we're not going to die. I am sure that this is going in Sawyer's head right back to the incident where Jack is saying, yeah, yeah blowing up a nuclear bomb, don't worry, it's not going to kill us. Right. This is actually what we need. And look how that worked out. Juliet kind, got killed. Kind of like that. This is a ridiculous claim that Jack makes. Like on its face, it's ridiculous to say there is a bomb on a timer that is counting down. Oh, don't worry, it'll be fine. Like Sawyer makes the rational decision here. Sure. And it's hard not to sympathize with that. And, and, of course and, that, it, and that's what's so sad about it. Because yeah. Sawyer, Sawyer has done everything right. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can you can argue like the thing he did wrong was he got out manipulated by the man in black, which I think is also worth discussing separately. Mm-hmm. But from Sawyer's perspective, he has put everything into this of saving his friends. And when it comes down to it, he makes what is yet yeah, a totally rational call to not do what Jack says mm-hmm. because of past experience when it went terribly wrong and got Juliet killed. And yet that is the thing that leads to Jin and Son and Sawyer's death, Saeed's deaths. Yeah. I mean, how horrible is that? Yeah. I feel so bad for, Sa- for Sawyer. Absolutely. I mean, you're right about Sawyer, like in the last couple episodes, since Recon really, I think, has very quietly assumed the mantle that Jack set down. And there's never a, there's never a moment, there's never a conversation about it. He just starts to do it, which is very, very true to Sawyer's character, right? A man of action. Yeah, he's the one scheming. He's coming up with his own plots. He's making the calls in the moment and people are listening. Yeah. And all of it's to his credit. I mean, he does a pretty good job, I think. And and it yeah. still and it still works out in the worst way possible. Yeah. Um, and that reminds me, another thing that Sawyer does that's so brilliant this week, telling Jack to push Locke into the water. Mm-hmm. Sawyer says, just get him, get it in the water. I'll take care of the rest. Mm-hmm. And I went back because I had to remind myself of this, but it's in the episode, The Package, when Sawyer asks Locke, what do you need me to get you a boat for? Can't you just turn into smoke and fly your ass over the water? And Locke says, do you think I could still, if I could do that, I would still be on this island? And I'm pretty sure what's going on here is Sawyer hears that and just kind of makes a little mental note in the back of his mind, Locke's not good with water, can't turn into a smoke over the water. And so I think that's why... Oh. I think that is why Sawyer is telling Jack, push Locke into the water, why that's his specific instruction, because he's filed away that little factoid of Locke is no good with water. Huh. I didn't interpret that line about not being able to turn into smoke as having anything to do with the water. I thought it was just like, he's trapped on the re- the island for the same reason everyone else is. Like, no one can can fly off the island unless they have the perfect bearing. And I don't know. I You you might be onto something. I, I took it as, as Sawyer being extra brilliant. I could be wrong. Huh. Do you think, let me, let me ask you a question. So I was, I've been sort of debating this with a YouTube commenter, Lost Explained, who, who left us that hot take uh, last episode. Over this question of, like, does the man in black really know what he's doing? And I I tend to think that he's... I guess there's some folks out there who really think that the man in black, like, purposefully set up this specific scenario of get them all on the sub with a, in a situation where they have, you know, are all not trusting each other with a rigged bomb to get them to kill themselves. 
Whereas I tend to think that he was kind of making this all up as he went along and that some, you know, with a general idea maybe about what he wanted to do, but with, with a lot of times where he made, you know, sort of poor decisions. And what do you think? Did he really have this all mapped out or? I think if the man in black were that good at this, he would have gotten off the island by now. <laughs> right? Like, yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, not to, not to be too Occam's razor about it, but like. He's had many dozens of chances, right? Like how we, you know, there have been many candidates in the past. And surely some of those people have been trapped and tried to leave. And that's a very good point. You know, after thousands of years of, of trying out different plots, you'd think you would, you know. After thousands of years of trying out different plots. <laughs> yeah, totally. Not that they're all the same, and who who knows the frequency with which people come to the island, and and who's to say? But no, he's he's just human, or he was at some point. Yeah. You know, before we get to the Gene Higgins, just one last little note that I, I found here in my uh, in my notes to myself. I I loved that the they did this little teeny thing after the submarine stuff where they cut to commercial and then they come back to the flash sideways and it's Locke in the hospital. As Locke is rolling, being rolled down the hospital, you see Jin walking down mm-hmm. this hallway holding With the flowers. Yeah, and it's just such a, uh, just such a, a wonderful. I feel like a relief where it's, the show is reminding you, like, yes, they've they've died, but don't worry, their story's not over. There's something else here, and you know they're 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 still somewhere together. I, I thought that was really a lovely touch. That's a good call. I thought that was lovely, but anyway, Gene Higgins. Yeah, Gene Higgins was an executive producer on Lost. Uh, we played the first half of this conversation in our last episode. So if you missed it, go back and, and listen to that first. Maybe there's going to be some continuing themes. I'm looking through my notes here. One, one other sequence from the sixth season that released, you know, big dramatic sequence that stands out is the, the submarine at the yeah. end. Um, you know, the explosion on the submarine and, you know, the... the diff- just talk about that, the subset, and how you made that happen, because that's a dramatic and physically, I'm sure, very challenging sequence. Well, when we first started out, we had this little two-man sub that was probably uh, eight, ten feet big. When you first started out earlier in the show. With the know? submarine yeah. itself, yeah. right? And it was just a shell that sat on the water, because the dock and the, it's called the fish pond where we would shoot it was literally only two feet deep. Oh, wow. So nobody ever knew that there was no submarine below that shell on top, right? And then, as I recall, we built that three times. Each time it got bigger, sort of like the armory. Um, So that by the end, we had quite a sizable submarine. And um, now the interior of the submarine... We always shot at the Maritime Museum in an old World War II sub. Oh, that's super cool. Yeah. That's super cool. So literally, all the people and all the gear had to go down a hatch that was about this, you know, You're what, about two feet around. You're holding your arms in front of you. It's, yeah, in a circle, yeah. very narrow. Yeah. So, um, oh God, what was the name of that? It's on the tip of my tongue. Anyway, you can look it up. Yeah. It's there. It, it's right there in, um, in Pearl Harbor. So, <laughs> it's open to the public. We'd make arrangements, they'd close it for the day, we'd go down and we'd shoot the whole thing. Okay, so that's yeah. where you shoot the, the explosion. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the explosion was obviously, you know, effects or whatever. But, yeah. Okay. What about the flooding sequence? Because when that submarine floods and gin and sun die, how did you do that? Um, that was a set. Yeah. That was a set where we poured water in. Okay. Yeah. That was not at the Maritime Museum, no, I assume. No, that one was on stage. Okay. Yeah. It's very well done. Thank you. I yeah. thank you on behalf of, of the effects crew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, uh, I guess just say, I mean, there, there are other scenes or people I could ask you about. Are there any other, just any other, you know, moments filming or set up from the last year that come to mind, stuff that we haven't talked about? Yeah, it was, it was strangely unsettling toward the end. It was, it was one of those perfect lightning in a bottle shows. Do you ever get another one? You know, I, I think you could spend your whole career and come close. You know, there were good parts, there were bad parts, but I remember being totally surprised that when Jack stretched out in the bamboo forest and the dog came and lay down next to him, I started crying. You did. I don't cry. <laughs> I'm wow. not a crier. But 
I mean, there it was. And it wasn't even the last day of shooting. I mean, we had a ways to go on that show. And yet it was, wow, you know, this is quite the thing. That you're talking about yeah. the moment where he dies at the yeah. very end. Wow. Yeah. You, you were there when that was filmed? Oh, yeah. I cried. Oh. So, and it was, um, and you know, I've gone back to Hawaii to do shows a couple of times since. And you know, the dog is no longer with us, of course, either. And, uh, but there's still pictures in the health food store where we found him of him surfing. <laughs> Did the dog do what you want in that last scene of growing up to Jack? Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Oh, that's so oh, yeah. sweet. Yeah. Um, so there was a, yeah, there were a lot of moments when you were shooting, especially the, <coughs> excuse me, the finale where you went, this isn't going to happen again. So it was an experience. It was a life experience. Yeah. yeah. What What is it? I, I guess just. I, I don't know if there's an easy way to answer this, but what does it you know mean? It's been twelve years since it ended. What, what does it mean to you today, looking back, to know that you were you know that you made this show? I mean, just knowing what Lost is and sort of the canon. On the one hand, it's like, oh yeah, that was great. Didn't we have an amazing time? Of course, you discount the difficult stuff, you know, as the years and the filter goes on. Um, but it's also ancient history, mm. you know? I, I mean, it, it's like somebody that I gave a lost hat to the other day went, I wear my lost hat. Nobody knows what the show is. Really? And I went, yeah, that'd be about right. Ah. You know, and it's like, I, I like my season two hat, of which I had a couple, because I like the color, you know? It's that sort of mossy khaki green. Um, it doesn't matter that it says Dharma on the front of it. Nobody knows what it is. It says Dharma here, lost there. But so you have to put it in perspective. You know, it, it's sort of like, how good are you? You're as good as your last show. Mm. That's interesting. I mean, I, I'm biased because I make a podcast about it and I'm constantly in contact with fans, but there's still a lot of people out there who really love Lost. There are a lot of fans, and there's a lot of things we did on that show that. I think I told you this on our last our last interview. That show was low tech because of where we were, the budgets, the accessibility of things. But <clears throat> because it was low tech, meaning we didn't do a lot of very involved visual effects, it was sort of instantaneously gratifying. You knew if what you were doing was working right then. Um, as opposed to the show I just finished, which I think will be very good. But the constant refrain was, oh, let visual effects fix that. Oh, I'm, and I'm going, no, we should be doing this in camera. We should just do this. Right? Um, it's just a different approach. Hmm. A different approach. Do you think there will ever be a, I don't know, I don't know if sequel is the right word, but another... You know, another lost story, a story taking place on the island or in the lost universe that someone will make? Or do you think it's going to be set aside forever? Oh, I don't think it'll be a lost show necessarily. But, you know, survivors on an island is always going to yeah. happen. Right. No, but I, I yeah. mean specifically, do you think someone will try to make a, another, you know, a, you know, about those characters or about that island? Do you think ABC will ever try to do that again? No. You don't? No. Personally, just my personal opinion. Yeah. No, I why, don't think so. Um, first of all, ABC was always bright and happy. Disney Lost was an anomaly, I think, mm. at ABC. Lost was greenlit by a guy who was delightful, smart, intelligent. And then fired immediately And, after, and gone right? before yeah. we ever started doing season one. And God bless him, because I owe a huge portion of my life to him. Uh, but it, it was never a fit, you know? It yeah. was just, even though it was all there, and it was, at one time, the biggest show in the world, somehow it just never felt like it fit. Interesting. Um, so would ABC allow it? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe when it gets into the pantheon of, of 
oh, you know, it's like really ancient. <laughs> but I, and, you know, does Damon want to go back there? No, Damon I don't doesn't think want so. To go Been back. there, done that, yeah. you know? How do you top yourself when you already gave it everything you have? Mm. You know? Mm. So I, I think, no, and, and to me, life isn't like that. Life's boring. Let's go a different direction. Yeah. There's always something else. As a fan, it's hard for me to not want it, but I understand that. I yeah. understand that. Sometimes, sometimes I think the creatives look at it and go, that's it, this is it, we're moving on, it's the end, who cares, it's over. And sometimes I think I am maybe a bit too responsible, you know? The one thing I will tell you that Lost taught me is when to hold on and when to let go as a producer. And when to let go has a lot to do with the creative and what's going to work and what is going to advance the story and what's going to make it better. And you just have to know that if you're letting go here, you're going to figure out a way to make up for it over there. You may not know where or how yet, but you just do it. Because creatively, that's what the show needs. Um, yeah, one of the things, and I don't know what you think about this, but The Temple, it, it's one of those stories that I think a lot of Lost fans are kind of like, well, you know, what, not what was the point of that, but it was, you know, it was a little confusing. They were all kind of stuck there for a while, and then the monster comes in and destroys the whole thing. I think people always wanted a little more from The Temple. Um, I don't know. You probably have to talk to Damon about that. I mean, it was it was part of the journey, you know? Oh, it was exciting to see. I mean, it was super cool. Right, but when you look back and you go, okay, why were these characters there and what was going on? Really, it's like, is it, how do we arrive at where we all end up? There's different ways. Sometimes you go through the temple. Sometimes you go through nature. Sometimes you go through, you know, I mean, what is right for you? That's yeah. interesting. And I, what I found at the end is the people who thought, oh, well, the ending was sort of unsatisfying. I went, well, maybe it was unsatisfying because it just didn't go the way you believe. What, what was it? I mean, now I'm getting out of order on my yeah. question, but what was it? You were there that night when they filmed at the church, I assume? Oh, yeah. What, what was it like on set that night? It was very sobering. It was fun and, and sobering at the same time. It was a lot of sort of old times and music and we didn't shoot very fast because there was a lot of just nice stuff happening. Yeah. You know? I mean we got it all done, but it was it wasn't our normal lost speed. Boom 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 boom, you know. Does it, does anything in particular stand out in your mind, particular moments that night or things that people did or said? <sighs> no, it was a long time ago. Yeah. I remember that it was the first time people realized that Ben wasn't going through the door. Oh, the Michael Emerson that Ben yeah. wasn't interesting. Yes. So, and, and that was sort of surprising, and we went, well, he has a little more work to do. Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember asking Damon about that, and Damon yeah. said there was a lot of back and forth in the writer's room, should Ben be in the church or not, and they ultimately decided not. But it was, it was kind of sad as a fan that he doesn't get to be in there. Yeah. The, the one character and the one actor who I haven't asked you about that I wanted to, uh, Zuleika Robinson, who plays Alana that last year. Um, you're smart. You, I, I like Zuleika. You like yeah. Zuleika? I like, yeah. I mean, I, I think she's a good actor. What? Just what, I, I guess if you could just talk a little bit about what, what the arrangement was with her, what you guys were trying to do. Because she's a character who, again, you know, like, well acted, a lot of, you know, excitement about and potential. And then I, we just watched the episode where she just blows up out of nowhere and doesn't really get her backstory told. What, what was the deal with, with Zuleika and, um, and I think what happened more than once on the show okay. is Damon and Carlton would have a concept of where the season was going. And you only have so many scripts and so many storylines those scripts can service. And it's a very organic process. So I totally understand that you think it's going to go this way and you get there and it sort of makes a little bit of a left turn or a little bit of a right turn because that's what the story demands. And so what you thought you were going to do, maybe you didn't quite get there, but you did something else instead. But because you have to do the deals over the summer, right, you end up 
with a Zulika who didn't quite go where maybe the writers thought they would. Um, same thing happened another season when we had the couple that got buried alive. Oh, yes, Nikki and Paolo. Yes. You know, it, it's both the good and the bad of it, it's, you're not making widgets, you know? You're making, hopefully, art. Yeah. And it doesn't always come out the way you thought it was going to go. Do you remember, and, and just because you mentioned Ben getting left out of the church at the end, what... Michael Emerson's, I think, I mean, everyone knows he's one of the best actors. He's also probably the sweetest person that we've talked to. We've done three different interviews with him for the podcast. Do, yeah. Do you, any, any particular recollections of how he was handling that last year and just what, you know, what he did on that show at the end? Michael was just always wonderful yeah. to work with. I, I think my favorite story was when we were doing, there was a flashback to where the polar bear sort of emanated from. And I remember that he had to ride off on a horse, and I went to him and I said, Michael, do you know how to ride a horse? Knowing that he's from New York, right? It's sort of like, New Yorkers, you go, do you know how to ride a horse? Do you know how to drive a car? Do you, you know, various things. And without even saying yes or no, Michael looked at me and he goes, Gene, I find it so interesting that me, a rather small and bookish man, you are constantly beating up. <laughs> <laughs> I've never forgotten it. Yeah. I adore him. Oh, man. <laughs> it's that's, like, that's too yeah. funny. So he didn't know how to ride a horse is what you're talking about. He rode the horse well enough. Yeah. He, yeah. he had been on a horse before. Uh, <laughs> that really, that's so funny. He, he also told the story, he told us the story of how he, he had to learn to play piano. Overall, in a way, that's what loss did for actors is it gave them such a range that they could play. Right? Because of the flash forwards, the flash sideways, the flash backwards, you know, not just because of those, but it was such a broad tapestry. It wasn't this just procedural person who's there, you know? They really got to play very full, well rounded characters. And I think that added to the dimension of it all the time. You know, better roles, better actors. Uh, I mean, as they, they fed on each other, you know? Yeah, I agree with you. And I, I mean, this gets back to the question of how people reacted to the finale. I, I just think that, not, and not that I wasn't sort of one of these people at the time, but there were so many people who I think watched Lost as a show, a mystery about, you know, what was going to happen and what was the answers to the questions. And in retrospect, it feels pretty obvious that what made Lost so great were the, were the characters. Yeah. Um, it was a totally character-driven show. Everything else we did, it was a lot of fun. But it was character-driven. Yeah. And sometimes when... I mean, this isn't you, this is Damon and Arnold. Sometimes when you tried to answer those questions at the end, it wasn't that satisfying. Like, I just watched the episode where, where Harold Perrineau, where Michael comes back, and it's revealed that the whispers on the island were the, you know, the, the people who were stuck and couldn't move on. Yeah. I didn't think that was especially interesting or satisfying. I would have, I, I think, just leave that a mystery and focus yeah. on something else. Well, there's always people who want it tied up with a bow, and there's people who want it open ended. Yeah, you know, I happen to prefer open ended because then the audience brings whatever works best for them to it, and it's the people who want everything tied up with a bow that ultimately are disappointed because maybe the wrapping isn't the color they wanted or the ribbon isn't. When, the you, they wanted when you were making the finale, did you have an expectation or a thought in your mind that there were going to be some people who were going to be really unhappy, or did that not even occur to you? Oh, we all talked about it. You did. But it, what were you going to do about it? What kind of conversations did you have about it? I'm curious. <laughs> well, it's like the Sopranos had ended, and everybody was talking about, oh, wasn't wasn't a great ending, wasn't a great ending, you know? And you'd be like, well, what are they going to think about our ending? And ultimately, we all went, this is our ending, take it or leave it. Hmm. You know? And why shouldn't the Sopranos have that ending? One one last set piece that was on my mind for the sixth season, the uh the well that they dropped Desmond into. You remember that Des Ian was stuck in a well for several mm-hmm. weeks? Was he wasn't actually down at the was there actually a well somewhere that you put him in? No, we dug a hole. You dug a hole. We dug a hole. It was probably 10, 12 feet deep. But you really did dig a hole and stick him down at the bottom of the hole, at least? 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Same as the tiger cages, we dug a hole. Same as the tiger cages. <laughs> I will never forget. We had this very nice director, Canadian guy. He'd been doing a lot of The Sopranos. Emmy winning, right? And, and this is back to your thing about, you know, did you like what you did and how you did it? Um, like I said, we were very basic, very hands-on, very low-tech. Um, and in the beginning, not a lot of money. Um, so when we had the tiger cage, and I'm, I think, what is this, first, second season? Uh, for some reason, oh, we were shooting two units that day. Oh, this was the, the, this is the, tail, the tail crew, the tail end section of the plane where they, had, they were throwing people into a pit to... Yeah. yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, so anyway, we had this pit, and it was about 12 by 12 and about 15 feet deep. And um, we had two crews working the day this director showed up, so I ended up being the one to show them all the usual places. Uh -huh. And then we'd go location scouting the next day for the specific ones. And so we get to where this particular camp is and the tiger pit, and I remember him looking at me, and he goes, um, and of course you've recreated this on stage, right? And I looked at it and went, nope, no room on stage and no money to do it. And he sort of blanched. He says, well, how do you shoot? I said, well, we either crane down into it or we put a hand cameraman down there with a camera, handheld, and we shoot. I lost him. That you, is the day I lost him. You the lost day he direct. showed up. <laughs> so he didn't direct it? Oh, no, he did. Okay. He did. It was just there's personalities. Yeah. Not every director can direct every show. Not every right. show is correct for every director. Right. Be right. Yeah. Um, and we learned early, by the time we got to season six, we had a pool of like five or six directors that just worked over and over and over again. Cause um, but, uh, but, so but when Desmond was in the well, did you, you stuck a camera down there with him or how did you do yeah, it? Yeah. yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So and I'm trying to think, did we do that well on stage? We may have done that well on stage. Yeah. I think We've so. come back to it a couple of times. Yeah. 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 So, so one, one thing that Rosie, my co-host, and I like to do at the end of every season of Lost um, is to pick an, a most valuable player and a least valuable player for that. I won't make you do a least valuable player. That would be unfair. But okay. unless you want to, in which case, go ahead. <laughs> who, who would you, in terms of the making of the sixth season, if you had to nominate someone besides yourself, because uh, I'm sure you were the MVP, who, who would you nominate as the MVP? Oh, are you of, talking cast or career? And anyone. The making of that last year, of that last season, who was the most valuable player to you? Damon. Always. Da always Damon? Always Damon. Yeah. It was Damon's vision. It was Damon's understanding. And you have to remember, I had just started doing TV about a year and a half before Lost. So I went from a year on CSI Miami, and then I did half a year with my friend, well, not even half a year, first half of a season, uh, with my friend Ian Patterson, who was desperate for some help, couldn't find somebody, on a show called Line of Fire. At Christmas time, I'm looking for a new job, and I'm talking with my agent, and she's going, oh, there's nothing out there, there's nothing out there. So being from features and used to being calling around anyway, I hear about this show called Lost. So I call up my friend, who I have done a number of, you know, movies of the week, or pilots with at ABC, and I go, tell me about this show called Lost. She goes, can't talk about it. Come meet me for lunch. <laughs> so I go, okay. So I go have lunch with her. She goes, do you know J.J. Abrams? I went, no. Do you know so-and-so? I went, nope. She goes, oh. You ever been to Hawaii? I went, I'm going. Get me a meeting. <laughs> so that was it. That So Lost was literally, I had done one and a half years of TV and jumped into Lost. It was, I, I think it was great because I like epic. You know, if somebody's going to do with my dinner with Andre, I can appreciate it. I don't want to make it. Mm. Okay. Um... I don't mind if it's hard. I like big. I like imposing. I like fun stuff. And Lost very quickly was all of that and more, you know? What was the hardest thing you ever had to do on Lost? No good. Well, let's start with the pilot. I had six weeks of prep. I had... When we first started talking, I thought, oh, there's a graveyard for planes. I'll go over there. <clears throat> Look at Barbara's Point. I'll come up with some sort of plane. I'm in Hawaii for about three days. 
and I get this phone call. JJ wants a wide body. I'm going, there's no wide body here. Right? So I have to find a plane, get it cut up, get it shipped over, and put back together in six weeks. Half of it at the beach, half of it at the jungle. And oh, um, at the beach, you can't dig holes because you may find bones, right? So now, not only does JJ want the entire fuselage and back end at the beach, he wants it upside down, which means that I have 45,000 pounds sitting on 20,000 pounds. So, and the wing up in the air so it can come down. And we have to sit there really quick and figure out how we set up this whole structure without it damaging the beach. And um, we're talking, we're talking, we're on Monday, and I'm with the, the, the special effects guys. And having just done this not too long ago, this episode of CSI Miami where we had to dump a car into a canal in Long Beach, um, I happen to know that trench plates weigh a thousand pounds. <laughs> right? And we're trying to think of something that we can anchor this structure with without digging a hole in the beach. And I'm going, guys, what if we get a bunch of trench plates and we build a structure, a square structure, and we stack up trench plates to hold up? And that's what was inside of that plane. Because I have all the weight. I built, I put no hole on the beach. Right? Wow. And that's that's what held up. The, and if you look at it, it's slowly getting a little more elliptical. Is <laughs> <it's just laughs> the way it's shifting slowly, slowly. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. So no, that's no wonder you've got the director's go word <laughs> on your wall there, because that's ridiculous. But, um, and, but here's the interesting thing is I had to take it away and put it back up for the... Because nobody knew if it was going to go after the pilot, right? Mm -hmm. Then I had to re-put it back up. And then I remember calling Damon and Carlton going, guys, you know, the North Shore surf is going to hit. I have to get this plane off the beach. I don't care how clean we made it. It's never clean enough. We're going to have an ecological disaster and it's going to be our fault. That plane has to stay, Gene. It's iconic as whatever. Uh, 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 it can't stay. You have to get them out of here. So that's why they did the story on the show about that, right? Right. Yeah. Because it had to come off before, you know, the 30-foot waves hit. And um, and so, <laughs> oh, yeah, we we made it by two days. You made it by two days? Two days. And that, in terms two of days. getting it off of there before? Wow. Two days. And that year, the waves came in because, you know, normally the waves throw the sand up on the beach in the wintertime and they pull it back out in the summertime. So by the end of the summer, the beaches tend to be smaller until the waves come. That beach went away that year and never came back. Really? If you go up to that point where the plane was, there's not enough beach. Wow. It doesn't exist. So you were really there right at the right moment. Yeah. So I know we, we sort of started on this, but it was before we were recording. So uh, for, for folks who want to keep following your work, what, what are you working on now and where can they see it? Um, I just finished a show called Bad Monkey. It's Warner Brothers for Apple TV. It will air sometime next spring. Um, very funny. Showrunner is the same guy that does Ted Lasso. Oh, hey. The writing good. is... It's Bill Lawrence? Yes. Oh, excellent. The writing is brilliant. Um, the cast is great. Vince Vaughn is very funny. And it's based on a Carl Hyacin book, so read the book. But, oh, Carl won't like this. I think the show is even better. <laughs> <laughs> but Carl is a lovely man, too, guy. So that's, uh, that's Bad Monkey. It'll be on Apple Bad TV. Bad Monkey, and... made in spite of COVID and in spite of hurricanes. Gene, Gene thank you so much for oh, being with Oh, thank you. It's nice to see you again. You know, I really loved talking with Jean, and I just got to say, like, she is an unsung hero of loss, like, mm. just literally, like, arranging the plane for the pilot and stuff like that. I mean, she physically made this show, and, and all Lost fans deserve, uh, she deserves to be recognized by all Lost fans for making this thing happen. Go, Jean.
Yeah, I think, I mean, I know we ask everyone the question about what did they make of the finale, but I really loved Jean's answer about what I felt like she was saying was, I don't, I don't care so much if you agree with my interpretation. Like, I want to leave it open-ended so it can mean, so the audience can bring whatever they want to it, is the way that she put it. And I don't know, I really, really like that. Like, the idea that the writers and the, the, the show's creators and the actors were, you know, telling a story. But this is like what all great works of literature are about. Like, if it means something different to you... That's great. That's what art is about to me. And I just, I I, I appreciate that there is, you know, still room now that maybe now that we have a little bit more distance from Lost for us to say, you know, oh, okay, that really, that part really resonates with me. That part maybe doesn't so much. And I think that's what sets apart maybe a work of art from the rest. I I agree completely. I think that's why we're still talking about Lost 12 years after it ended, because there's, there's so much left to interpretation I love Mm -hmm. it about it. I also, um, I thought her comment was super interesting about Lost being sort of an anomaly at Disney, you know, like bright, happy Disney. And then you had, you know, Lost airing on ABC and and she, that was her answer about why, you know, why she thinks they'll never replicate it or why why there will never be another, you know, a sequel or another Lost show universe because, you know, because this is just not what Disney does. But I, I just, actually, I'm not so sure about that anymore. I was thinking, you know, Disney... Between Disney Plus, which which has a lot of variety in it now, and Hulu, and like ESPN is doing sports betting, ESPN is within Disney. Like, I I kind of think that the the content landscape is shifting in such a way that even if maybe there wouldn't have been room in the recent past for Disney to, you know, try something like this again within the Lost Universe, that uh, that maybe there's maybe there could be the appetite for it now with just the greater variety of stuff they're willing to make, and also just the incredible, you know desire to feed the content beast on on streaming i i I bet it happens i'm I'm gonna put it out there i think it'll happen okay i don't know if we'll have to have an extensive discussion of this as we get into the the final few episodes here oh my goodness but i don't know if i would want more lost i probably would i would certainly watch it what am i even saying (laughs) i like how you considered that for all of two seconds like wait Yeah. yeah Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't want another main cat, right? I wouldn't want another Jack or another Kate or another Hurley story. I'd watch more Sawyer, to be sure. I'd watch a Saeed spinoff. Well, let's discuss this before the end here. Yeah. Yes. Um, we'll we'll get to it. We'll we'll be back though in uh, in two weeks with Across the Sea. Yeah, and our our guest that week will be Tucker Gates, who you heard way back early in this season, but he directed that episode. So we're really going to get into what worked what maybe didn't work so well. Um, and he's he's really honest about his thoughts. It was a really great conversation. We know you've all got hot takes about Across the Sea, so uh, call us and, and tell us what, uh, what you think. 60 seconds or less, please. The number is 9546-DHARMA, plus one if you're not in the United States. We also take um, voice messages through Facebook, direct message if, if calls don't work for you. Yes, and you can find that page at facebook.com slash thehatchpodcast. We are also on Twitter at the Hatch Podcast. Rate and review uh, The Hatch if you can as well, please. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you listen. Let us know what you think. Our theme music is by Andy G. Cohen, and our cover art is by Danny Roth. And we'll be back in two weeks. Namaste. Namaste.